Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Kia ora koutou. Mr. Speaker, this bill purports to, um, to improve public safety and to increase confidence in the justice system by imposing longer sentences and making certain offenders ineligible for, for parole. Those are admirable um, intentions. We all would like both to practically increase public safety and people's perception of safety, which is equally important. Unfortunately, there's nothing in this bill which would contribute to either of those things, confidence or safety. In fact, all the evidence points to the exactly the opposite conclusion, that in fact these sorts of regimes will do nothing for public safety, will probably make our societies more dangerous, uh, more unequal and more divided. This is a very punitive, a very reactive approach, a very reactive proposal. And for a host of reasons that have been alluded to, this bill is unlikely to have any real effect and it cannot have any effect for at least another 10 years, even if it were um, imposed in the legislation. And that is something which has not been made clear to people. The Ministry of Justice has said that the deterrence effect of the regime is uncertain, which I think is very polite language. The Department of Corrections has also demonstrated real scepticism that there will be any deterrent impact from this bill. Again, the language one doesn't have to read very carefully between the lines to see that the expertise in those two key departments is all telling us that in fact this simply will not work. <coughs> the bill will not reduce offending, will not reduce offending. And after having heard so many promises, so many assurances, the expectation of the public will be disappointed and it will serve to diminish people's confidence in our justice system. They again will ask, why has it failed? Why do we not feel safe? Why are the, crimin the crime numbers not telling us we're in a better situation? This bill is a classic example of an end of pipe solution, one where you attempt to tidy up the mess, deal with the symptoms at the end of a process, rather than go to the root cause, to the beginning of whatever process is causing that mess in the first place. Putting focus on locking offenders away for longer and giving them tougher time while they're in there is simply an exercise in storing up trouble. Eventually these offenders will be released after be it 5, 10, 20 years, however long. With a very few exceptions, people will come back into society so alienated, so brutalised that they will be almost impossible to reintegrate. We are literally storing up trouble for ourselves by putting people, serious offenders, in prison for longer and treating them in this way that's proposed in the bill. The time and effort that's been frittered away on this non-solution, this attempt to put a band-aid on a gaping wound, would be much better spent on some of the real solutions. There are some truly sensible people in this country who are despairing of us breaking the cycle of offending and re-offending of people entering jail for the first time as offenders and coming out as very skilled criminals. We share in the Greens with so many in the communities who do not share this obsession with retribution and punishment for its own sake. We look for evidence-based solutions. We look for solutions that will work for the community. And this legislation being debated today simply fails to meet those simple tests of value. We know there are numerous changes that could be made to lower the incidence of violent offending and reduce offending. A study done by the Correction Department 10 years ago into the prevalence of mental illness revealed that of the total prison population, some 90 per cent had a current substance abuse uh, or dependence diagnosis, and only 35 of those were receiving adequate treatment at that time. The report also noted, noted that substance abuse disorders are known to contribute to reoffending among offender populations, almost taken for, as a given. Ten years on, the recent Law Commission issue, law commission issue paper on, elk, on liquor includes a summary of the relationship between crime and alcohol and other drug abuse and dependence. And it estimates something like 76,000 people are currently in need these are people who come into the justice system as either accused or as offenders. And these people are in need of some kind of intervention, some sort of drug or alcohol treatment. And of those 76,000 in need of help, judges were able in the last 12 months or so, in the last year, to order own of scarcely more than 6,000. Only about 7% of that number 
were ordered to attend a substance abuse program simply because those programs are not there. They are not funded. They do not exist. There is a massive need for increases in the programs, drug and alcohol abuse programs. Otherwise, people are going to stay on the treadmill of repeated and increasingly serious offending. The National Committee on Addiction Treatment suggests that at least a doubling of funding would increase the number of people able to be treated, to perhaps to 50,000, which still leaves a significant gap between those needing help and those in front of the justice system. Until we begin to adequately address some of these primary causes, like drug and alcohol abuse and dependency in the prison population, these longer sentences and other so-called make-believe solutions are just so much window dressing. A second area where relatively small sums of money invested could have a real and positive effect on reducing, prison, uh, reducing offenders, and that is in terms of providing better support and assistance to the families of offenders. This can improve prisoner behaviour in the prisons, in jail, while they're serving their sentences, and certainly will increase their, their likelihood of them keeping out of trouble when they come out. On occasion, family backgrounds are part of the root cause of offending, but in many more cases, positive family relationships, maintaining those relationships, will go a long way to break the offending recycle. Comparative studies in Europe demonstrate that a combination of shorter sentences, not longer, but shorter sentences, and family-oriented prison policies and practice are major factors in protecting children from the harmful effects of parental um, imprisonment and can break that intergenerational cycle. Children who have um, who are families adequately supported, it means those children are much less likely to become offenders in their term. The relevant research in New Zealand around the relationship between imprisonment and the effect on families is some 10 or 20 years old. No decent work has been done for nearly two decades. All of the work that has been done points to the fact that some really simple strategies could help us reduce the offending. Small amounts of financial assistance with travel, improving prison visiting conditions and facilities, information on prison protocols being made available to families. There's no current research, but the anecdotal evidence is overwhelming that from the, the base, the organisations, the voluntary and community organisations working in this, that very little has changed in the last two, uh, two decades. I've spoken personally to families of inmates, as I'm sure others in this House have, and you hear the same stories again and again. Even for people who are educated, confident in dealing with bureaucracies and government departments, people who are resourced, people who have jobs and incomes, even for those people it's incredibly difficult for them to get basic information about often where their family member is, what, in what ways can they assist them, how can they maintain a relationship with these people. It is um, exponentially more difficult for someone from a disadvantaged background, somebody without an education, without an income, with um, dependent children on a benefit. It's almost impossible for those people to break through those barriers. And I've heard that from the families of, of inmates, and I've heard acceptance of the point also from corrections officers, people working in the system, working in the prisons. And it's time that we put some real resource into those areas, because those are the real solutions. Lock them up, throw away the key is a 19th century approach. It's not worthy even of our attention. It shouldn't become before this House. My final comments I'll make would be, again, comments I'm sure have been made elsewhere and will be, that the process of getting this bill to the stage has been suboptimal, to say the least. Um, despite very significant and substantive changes from the original bill, there was completely inadequate opportunity for a second round of submissions, a highly prescriptive approach to engaging with the communities of interest, and it wonders at begs the question, what were the proponents of the bill afraid of? Why would they not allow a decent and a comprehensive um, second round of submission to a significantly changed bill? So, as you may have gathered from my comments, the Greens will continue to oppose this legislation and we hope there will be significantly better and more intelligent uh, proposals come to this House. Kia ora. I call the Honourable Rodney Hyde.